Hello, good morning everybody. Welcome to our conference on human rights, ethics and uh, artificial intelligence. This is an event jointly sponsored uh, by the FMJ Suffer Center for Ethics, the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society and the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. My, my name is Matthias Wisse, I'm the director of the Carr Center. It's a great pleasure <coughs> to see you here uh, this morning. Let me just say uh, a couple of words about why we are doing uh, this event. So from the from the car center and uh, the, the point here is to think about where uh, human rights matters are um, at this stage, given that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is turning 70, it's turning 70 on December 10th, 1948. So there's a number of things we have been doing uh, throughout the year, also uh, to, to a large extent looking back what has been achieved, uh, also thinking about what could have been achieved, how much better could we have done in, uh, in many ways since the Human rights standpoint is always uh, is always looking at the the position of the underdog, right? And so when, if you do that, you you always see you know all the many and you should be seeing all the many ways in which we are falling short, rather than patting yourself on the shoulder and feeling accomplished about how, how we have come. Even though also I think uh, there's uh, good evidence to uh, to uh, <coughs> to assert that without the human rights movement, uh, things would be much worse uh, in the world these days. So so these are this, these are various lines of inquiry you can. Uh, can engage in on the occasion of the 70th anniversary, but you can also look forward and think about what's coming our way, what, is the, what are the challenges uh, for the next 70 years and, uh, and also beyond, and that then leads us to technology. Right? So there's a lot of technological innovation <coughs> happening around us. Artificial intelligence is, is, is one set of such innovations, but there's a, there's a lot of other things going on around us. So, so it's a, it's a, from, from the human rights standpoint, it's a time to look ahead and think about what are the human rights challenges going forward. But that's also where other places uh, at Harvard connect to us, where we are thinking more broadly, what are the normative challenges, ethical challenges that arise uh, in, uh, in the domain of technological innovation. That's really, that's the theme of this conference, where we want to bring people together from around the university and beyond to, to think about the normative challenges that arise around technological innovation. That's been the motivation for uh, the, <coughs> the speaker setup. So we have uh, uh, altogether six sessions uh, today. Uh, we uh, Five of them are with an individual speaker, and then in the afternoon we also have um, a, um, a panel with, uh, with, with several speakers doing flash presentations. So that's going to be the, the, the lay of the land. Uh, I apologize for the early starting time today since we have it. <laughs> So we had a lot to fit today, I, so I'm assuming that you know the conference is actually at uh, the registration is actually closed because you know we're all sponsored. So I'm assuming there will be more people coming uh, in. But uh, without further ado, so um, let me introduce um, our um, distinguished first speaker, Barbara Gross, uh, who is one of the uh, is a pioneer uh, in in many things, one of the most distinguished scientists on on campus, a pioneer in many things, including also. Uh, the integration of uh, ethical considerations into computer science uh, education. So this is something uh, that uh, Barbara Gross, in, in collaboration with Alison Simmons in the philosophy department, has built uh, over the years. So, so in addition to much of the pioneering work that uh, that uh, Barbara Gross has also done in her uh, in her own academic niche, she has also done amazing work building these bridges to other disciplines to also make sure that consideration of ethical issues is built into science education uh, for, uh, for, for those of our students who actually will be designing, will be creating the future by actually building the systems uh, that, that will drive innovation uh, in, in the future. So, so without further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Barbara Brooks. Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and um, I will talk about that a little bit later. Um, uh, so the, um, the title here is inspired by the course of my own efforts in integrating ethics into computer science education. It started with a course, which I'll say something about later, on intelligent systems design and ethical challenges, which is specifically about AI, and then um, that inspires moving to integrating uh, ethics into all, of, into all of computer science. So 
that's to come. But um, I want to. So how many of you have taken an AI course? Okay, so you'll have to bear with me for a bit um, because I want to say something about what AI is and what it isn't, although I will do it in the positive. So we now have, I thought when I first was working in the field, which wasn't quite as long ago as the Universal Declaration, but more than halfway. <laughs> um, uh, and I said I worked on I worked in artificial intelligence. People asked me if I worked for the CIA and what kind of intelligence I created. <laughs> Little did they know. Anyway, now everybody has day-to-day -day experience with um, AI systems, um, with Netflix, with recommendation systems, with, oh, I left my phone in my car. Somebody hold up a phone, with speaking to their phones, um, with cleaning their houses. Some people have it. Um, those brave or foolish souls at Facebook. Um, I'm not on Facebook, I should say. Um, so what, what exactly, and AI is in the news now, and um, one, of my, one of my concerns is that what's in the news isn't really accurate about what AI is. So there are really two prongs to the field of artificial intelligence. Um, one is to understand intelligence. It's really a scientific discipline. And I'm going to go somewhat quickly through these, um, these first slides. But it's really, it's, um, it's related to the cognitive sciences. How is it that we do what we do um, when we act intelligently, which may not be always? And really, how can we develop the kinds of uh, theoretical models, the kinds of um, computational models and algorithms that let an, a system embody that intelligence? And the other, as this uh, points out, is to actually build systems that embody that intelligence, and they can be individually uh, doing things like interpreting natural scenes or interpreting language, or they can be putting things together as in robots that wander around the hall and talk to you and uh, do things for you. Every system that has some AI in it has lots of other computer science. And Matthias, I was really glad when you talk about technology in the future that you commented on AI was part of it, but not all of it. Because it's really important to understand that the issue with ethics and computing systems is not an issue solely with artificial intelligence. And in fact, some of the challenges that come up come up from the chance, from the difficulty of that um, interaction. So that's one lesson I hope you'll take from this early part. The second is that AI is not just deep learning. And I have to always explain deep learning. Deep learning, how many people have studied philosophy here? A little bit. The word deep in deep learning has <laughs> nothing to do with what you think of as deep. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> so, forget compositional semantics. It doesn't work. It means that there are many layers, like deep layers of the neural network. That's all. Okay. So, <laughs> just saying, intuitions fail. Okay, so there are basically two different types of AI. Uh, methods. The first, which is on the, the top two things, there are model-based methods, and the last are, are data-dependent methods, methods rooted in statistical, um, in statistics. The, the, and I've listed them in the order in which they historically were used, but there's no reason that had to be the way it was. Um, there's as much politics in AI as there is in any other field. Maybe a little less, I don't know. Um, so logical reasoning. Here, the models are symbolic. They're very easy for us as people to interpret. I've listed some of the things that they're used for um, here on the slide and things that you might, you might hear. I just wanna, I'm gonna come back to formal models of collaboration and teamwork because this is an area in which the data-driven models have so far totally failed to do anything. And I'm only mentioning some things. Then there are methods rooted in probability in the acknowledgement that the world we live in is uncertain. And the logical methods don't deal with that. And so people brought, we're still building models, um, that is, thinking about what the information was about the world that the computer system needed and how you might represent it in a system and then how you might manipulate that information. And you'll hear terms like Bayesian reasoning and sequential uh, decision making 
algorithmic game theory, I put it here, it could go somewhere else. But, and then there are the methods rooted in statistical reasoning, which include neural nets and deep learning. Okay, so model-based, data-based. Um, here's what's good about model-based methods. You have general theories. You have a semantics for the models. You can say, you can actually talk about what the system knows in the sense of what the, the model in the system represents in the world that we live in. The downside is those models are handcrafted. They require expert input. And so this, some people have labeled this knowledge engineering. I don't really like the title, but that's why it's in quotes. It's hard and brittle. If you forget something, it's, you know, the system doesn't know how to deal with it. Okay. The advantage of the data-based methods is you don't need any handcrafting. This has no expert input required, but those of you who saw, heard Cynthia Dwork yesterday will come to see that even with the data models, you are gonna need some experts at some point. So I think it's really, they're, they're beginning to see that they can't actually do without. It also typically requires large corpora of data, lots of data, hundreds, millions. There are many problems in the world that don't have that much data. There are many that do, and it's great where it, where it works. Um, I'll talk about a healthcare example where, uh, later where there isn't large enough data and probably never, we can hope never will. Um, the results are descriptive. They're not causal explanations, at least not yet. And again, if you heard Cynthia yesterday, um, they're dependent on the data that you have. Okay, so um, I'm gonna tell good news, bad news stories throughout the talk. Oops. Um, there are all of these exciting advances. This is the good news part of the talk that we know about in AI. Um, if you use a credit card, AI is making sure it's you and not somebody else. Um, how many of you talk to your phones? Wait, let me ask this. How many talk of you talk to your phones when you first could do it? How many of you still talk to your phones? Okay, it's cute, but okay. Uh, we'll come back to that. Um, whether you like it or not, you're subject to recommender systems because unless you have succeeded in blocking all ads on your browser. Um, we don't yet have self-driving vehicles. Um, we do have surgical robots. Um, let's look a little bit at the successes and then the challenges from the systems that each of these systems depends on some aspect of intelligent behavior. Some of them, like the um, vehicles, depend on more than one. Okay, so here's an enormous success in vision processing. Okay, um, and you can see it here on the slide, the accuracy of AI systems matches, in some, in some cases, exceeds that of humans. Now we have to dive a little deeper. Where is it, so first, it's an amazing success. When I started in AI, systems were blind and deaf. It was really hard to get intelligent behavior with respect to the world. Okay. Now they can do a lot. They, it, here's an example of where the system exceeds human performance. If the uh, data, the image base, which is true of ImageNet, which is where this data is from, if it includes dogs of various sorts, the system is much better at distinguishing among rare breeds than most of us would be. Okay, so if you see a graph like this, you have to be skeptical and say, wait, how did that happen? I, because I know, I know, so it's great. I want to say it's fantastic what it can do. Okay? But, we have to ask that question. And then we also have to ask, is it tested against data that's from a distribution just like it was trained on? Okay? So here's some examples. These examples are thanks to my former student at Kamar, who's at Microsoft. Um, probably you all know about Google and um, misclassifying faces of African Americans. Uh, uh, she, when she gives a talk, she says it's not just them, it's us also, and she uses this example. So this is a dress, but the, the answer, I don't know if you can read it, is I think it's a cat wearing a tie. Um, and you can probably see the colorful umbrella. Um, 
There's an image of a toothbrush in front of a young boy. The, the caption is, a young boy is holding a baseball bat. Um, if you put eyeglasses on some funny eyeglasses on people, then you can completely ruin the face recognition system. Um, if you put like big band-aids on stop signs, then suddenly they turn into yield signs or speed limit signs or keep right signs. Okay, so there's, um, oh yeah, and then also, um, you can attack these classification systems. Um, Cynthia talked yesterday about attacking encryption system. Changing just a few bits in the image, um, you, can, you can turn a school bus into something else. You can turn a dog into an ostrich. Um, not for people, but for the computer system. Okay, so um, one message from today, be skeptical. Ask what the system is doing, what it, what, over what range of data it's valid. Um, this, I owe this quote to Melanie Mitchell, who found it. Jatendra Malik is a uh, very distinguished vision researcher at the University of California, Berkeley. He says, knowing what he knows about computer vision, he'll never take, he won't take his hands off the steering wheel. I, by the way, I recommend that to you also. <laughs> if you have a Tesla, it doesn't actually have autopilot. It just has help feed. Okay, so what about closer to home in my, um, my own area of speech and natural language processing, which was the first area I was in. Well, the system. So truly, when I first worked on speech, the systems were deaf. We got, there was so much error in figuring out what the system actually said that you couldn't do much. Even with sentence level interpretation, and I was trying to do um, discourse level interpretation. So the, the um, progress is utterly amazing. Okay. Again, you see these, these graphs. This is accuracy on the so-called switchboard data, which is a huge corpus of data that was collected at AT&T when AT&T did research. Um, and the test is against that. And one thing that you can do to get a sense of the limitation of the speech systems is just listen. For a whole day, listen to the conversations you have and see how far they range. The worst ones are when you call customer service and you don't get the kind of answer that you want. Okay. But the ones you have with people range all over in their type, and th that database doesn't cover that range. Okay, so um, here's one of my favorite interactions with my phone, and I, I will show you some <laughs> examples. That my, in my class, the first assignment is to use their phone to figure out what, what, their, what it does well and what it does badly. Okay, this is the example I show them. I don't know if this still happens. It goes on and off. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I'm like, oh, where's the nearest gas station? I get a list of 16. I ask which ones are open, and I get this. <laughs> which is better than something I'll show you in a minute. And I later argued, and this is also my tip, another tip for the day. Look at the errors the system makes. That will tell you something about how it works. Any of you who watched Jeopardy win, I mean, the. What's the same Watson win in Jeopardy? Forget what it got right. Look at what it got wrong. And you will see the limit of its intelligence. Okay, so my students, this is due to students in my class. They found this, these examples. You ask where the nearest ER is, and it will tell you Mount Auburn Hospital or whatever is closest to us. Okay? Now you ask, where can I get a flu shot? You would think, right, right, if you asked a human being, where if I asked Matthias, where is the nearest ER, and he told me, and I asked where I could get a flu shot, he would give me an answer. It would not look like this. <laughs> what, kind of, what kind of, I, I, I couldn't figure out the launch's iTunes until I talked to a philosophy colleague of mine who said, oh, maybe it thinks flu shot is a music group. <laughs> okay. There you go, I'm out of tune, obviously. Okay, and now, Brandy, okay, so that's kind of funny and annoying, but when, what happens when you ask, <coughs> where can I go to get a sprained ankle treated? You get a list of web pages telling you how to treat a sprained ankle. Now, that doesn't seem so bad, unless, unless it weren't a sprained ankle, but something life-threatening, in which case you could be in real trouble. So. These errors that these systems make, like the errors that Tesla 
harm me are not simply annoying and and some of them are, are truly funny, but they raise ethical issues. Okay, the root of the problem, so I did work in dialogue, the root of the problem is that they don't really understand human dialogue. They just do statistics over a bunch of examples of human dialogue. And as I said a few summers ago when I was uh, talking at a, uh, giving an award talk at the uh, ACL, the Association for Computational Linguistics, Twitter is not real dialogue. It's, so this is a problem with the data-based methods. They look for where there's a lot of data. But where there's a lot of data is not necessarily what we do with our lives all the time. So um, one of my favorite examples, did the, co yeah, the color does come through up here, is, is up here. This was, I didn't collect this. This was somebody telling a story. So we're not even into the dialogue. But it illustrates the, um, the way in which language itself, and this is especially true in dialogue, is structured not by only by what we say, but by what we mean, and to understand what we mean, you want to understand the purposes or the intentions of what we're talking about. So um, I was taught, and some people are still taught, that pronouns refer to the last thing that was mentioned that matters in, in number and gender. And um, that would mean that the kids got put away. How many of you read this to think the kids got put away? So here's how this narrative went. John came by and left the groceries. Stop that, you kids! And I put them away after he left. No question. I have examples of people assembling a piece of equipment. A pronoun is used to refer to the piece of equipment. It hasn't been explicitly mentioned for half an hour. No, nobody involved in that dialogue had trouble understanding it. And nobody reading the transcript thinks it's up. OK, so you can't ignore this. Oops. Also, I mean, and people probably know about the table. You can't ignore who you've learned from. How, what's the quality of the source? And I think an especially important thing that has been stunning to me is how a few bad actors can really ruin the world for everybody. You know, like the guy who poisoned Tylenol pills, so now I can't open the jar? That's what's happened on the internet. Because a few bad actors can turn, as somebody, as somebody said, can, can, can turn your best, can turn a chat, a, what is it, uh, can, can go from humans are super cool to a Nazi in 24 minutes. Okay, or in, 20, in less than 24 hours. Um, it's all over in the language arena. How many of you um, read a few years ago about the Barbie doll that's going to have a dialogue with your daughter? This came out just as I was first teaching my course, and I thought, oh, I was looking for an example. Okay. This was sold as something that's going to be your daughter's best friend for three to eight-year-olds. So here's, here's the start of a conversation. This is out of the New York Times Magazine story. Um, you'll see that systems tend not to understand negatives. So the, take the, the, um, the child says to Barbie, her sister does nothing nice. And Barbie asks, what's the last nice thing she did? <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> and then the kid says, well, she helped me with my project. And then she destroyed it. Okay. Oh, yeah, tell me more. Um, goes on for a while, <laughs> and um, Barbie is persisting in telling her, in not hearing what the child is saying, to the point of saying she might appreciate hearing. Okay. Think about, so, um, so Bar the Barbie doll works from a script. Many of the customer service systems work from a script or something pretty close to a script that's a template with just, you know, first name, last name is left out, okay? The problem is nobody, no human adheres to a script for very long, very easily, and for sure, four-year-olds don't, okay? <laughs> so here are just some of the challenges this brings up. First of all, the doll is unremittingly pleasant. I haven't met a four-year-old who's unremittingly pleasant. For that matter, I haven't even met a 40-year-old, okay? <laughs> And it's teaching the kid not to listen. OK, so I'm not going to go through all of this. What happens when you call a customer service system and you get 
um, you get one of these computer systems that's supposed to chat with you, and then it fails. How many of you have had that experience in the last month? Or ever? Okay. What happens is it hands it off to a person. So the system first sets up expectations that you can say a lot of complicated things by saying complicated things to you. We're very good at imitating the people we speak with. So if they say something, we think we can say something equally complicated and they will understand it. This happens to me every time I try to speak French or Hebrew, by the way. <laughs> I say a little bit and they think I'll understand a lot, but I don't. And my, my accent's not bad, it's really, really challenging. Okay, so here's, the, so, so that's one problem. The systems fail because they say something and then you say back to them something like that and they can't handle it. Um, people talking to the systems, and this happened a lot when Facebook first put its assistant in, they assume they're talking to a system, not a person. And then they find out a person heard what they said. And they might have said something they don't want, to hear, want a person to hear. Okay, and the final thing, which um, this is one of my soapboxes, it makes for a horrible job for the person and a horrible experience for us. And there are alternative ways that system could have been designed. It might have saved a little bit less money for the corporation and their stockholders. It would have saved us time and it would make the job much better. So here's a hint of one of the things we need to think about if we're thinking about people have a right to have a job. They have a right to have a good job, not just a job. Okay, so um, here's the bottom line, an issue for many AI systems. If you think about designing the system as an isolated individual, you ignore the people who are around. And the car manufacturers are seeing that we don't behave like their specifications tell their cars they ought to. So there's a real people challenge. And we also heard that actually in what Cynthia said. So just um, uh, briefly, I wanted to mention that I chaired, this is now more than two years old, but I chaired, there's a project out of Stanford called the 100 Year Study of AI that is taking the pulse of AI every five, about every five years. Um, we won't be around, in, at least I won't be around in 100 years, but the idea is to look forward and backward and see where things are. And this is the, um, the focus of this first report was on AI and life. Where might AI affect daily life? Looking forward 15 years, so to 2030. Um, and they looked in these, they had to, it was a, a done under short time scale, on a short time scale. They looked in these different areas. Um, here are two really important things to see. AI, in the successes, and there are successes in all these areas, is specialized to the task. This is all in the report, by the way, which you can get from the website. The, the problems depend on the task. So for transportation and home service robots, there are hardware problems. It's really interesting, isn't it, that we have had the Roomba, we have had vacuum cleaners in houses for a long time. There's nothing else at that scale that succeeded because there are people and people's environments there. Um, healthcare and education importantly take partnering with people. Another one of my hobby horses, which you'll hear again, trying to get rid of the people is a mistake. So just different things. So I am, in fact, um, now going to uh, segue into, oh, let me just go back and say that interpersonal interaction is important for everything at the bottom of the screen. It points just at employment and workplace, but everybody. Okay, so now I want to shift a little bit to that, just that hobby horse, which is to say for a system to be smart, to be really smart, it has to work well with people. And every citizen of the world should insist on systems that work well with them, not accept systems that work badly for them. Um, my doctor friends know I tell them to rise up in arms against electronic health record systems, which were designed for the billing department with the excuse that the doctors wouldn't come to the focus groups. Um, okay. So I argue with my colleagues that they should focus on augmenting human intelligence, not replacing it that we want what's on the left, in the left picture, not what's in the right picture, <laughs> okay? 
my students abroad. We never found, found that. Okay. So. Listen, thank, thank Tyler, collaborate right now, right here. That's what my... Okay, I won't go on this. Okay, so many, many, many years, she also found this cartoon. She's much better at finding cartoons than me. Okay, years and years ago, I, I argued that teamwork is not simply the sum of individual plans. Are there, how many people in here are graduate students or postdocs? <coughs> Raise your hand, five, okay. So when I came up with this claim and argued that collaboration had to, couldn't, be, couldn't be passed on, it had to be built in from the start, and I argued against the predominant view in AI on planning, that plans of individuals wouldn't suffice, people, males, they were all males, they were all taller than me, not that that's so hard to do, and they said, there, there, literally one of them patted me on the head, just think harder. If somebody said that to you, just go away and come up with a simple proof that they're wrong, <laughs> which you probably will be able to do. Okay, so complimenting people. Here's an example of complimenting people in the data-dependent approaches. So many people think that we develop the theories that we develop in the um, model-based approaches. Some people think they won't carry over. Um, Eche Kamar at Microsoft has done really interesting. Ooh, ooh, oh, well, <coughs> really interesting work in showing that if you put people in the loop with AI systems depending on data, you get better machine learning results than if you leave people out. And she argues that, um, see if I can get this right, that these systems are of people, by people, and for people, and therefore people should be involved throughout training, evaluation, and execution, and I, I recommend her work to you. Okay, here's the power, I love this example, um, which comes also, she, she also pointed this out to me. Here's an example of the power of the combination, and this actually comes from a paper that was a prize paper in a machine learning conference, um, and that was very proud that the machine by itself had only 6% error, which was, as the paper says, very close to people's 3.4% error. But now look at what happens if you put people and the computer together. Half a percent error. And this is true for many things. Because we have complementary cognitive capabilities. So it's, it's important even in the data set. Okay, so I wanna switch gears now. So that's the argument that what AI is, and an argument that we should really move toward collaborative systems, which now actually I'm very happy to say corporations are talking about this, other researchers. <coughs> After 40 years, you're glad to hear that people have heard you. Um, okay. I want to turn now to the topic of AI and social good. And um, here's where I want to mention the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which I read in preparation for this talk. And um, the first thing that struck me reading through it was that it had the equivalent of um, what one would say in uh, terms of the Ten Commandments, the, te the Ten Commandments, seven of the Ten Commandments are negatives. Don't murder, don't steal. I forgot what the rest of them are that we're not supposed to do, but there's seven of them. Only two are positive, one of which is honor your mother and your father. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is almost all positive commandments. It's what we should do. So I would urge all of you who are terrified of AI, which you shouldn't be by the way, to instead start thinking about all of the realms of human rights that AI, if well designed, and that's a big if, could help with. And there are many of them that people are already working on. So there have been, I just have on this slide, the AAAI, the Association for the Advancement of AI, is a major international uh, society. They've had several symposia now related to social good. You can see on this slide some of the areas in which people are working. 
every single one of those areas requires thinking about the ethical consequences of what you're doing. So for example, someone, I think someone in the Harvard meeting said um, that he had been excited about, with all of the immigration issues in this country, building an app that would help families find each other until he realized that that same app could get used by ICE to find people, okay? So AI and technology overall has to the nth degree the problem that all science and technology have, which is you could use them for good or ill. So as you, the thing about technology is it spreads quickly. People really have to think about not just, so we're all, kind of cognitively built to figure out what we want to do and do it. And this is certainly true in computer science. Remember when I said when I started, machines were blind and deaf. It was a miracle they did anything. When I was finishing my PhD, I was work walking with one of my peer graduate students and he said to me, good thing we don't care about making money because AI will never amount to anything. <laughs> That's the end of our crystal ball, okay? It's amazing, it's out there. But we haven't caught up to the idea that stuff is out there. And so we're so focused on making it work, we don't think about whether it should be or how it should be defined. And I think this is really a big issue. Um, so I just wanna say something um, about two examples of AI for social good. One is a project that I'm doing in collaboration with the primary care clinic at Stanford. Um, with students of both places, and, well, in, the, in medicine you have, uh, I forgot what they're called, res, uh, residents, and not just residents, but, but new trainees, and that's from my postdoc. Okay, children with complex conditions, which could be genetic in origin or could come from an accident, see 12 or 15 caregivers. Some are physicians, um, some are teachers, and so on, There's, there are several here. Electronic health records do absolutely nothing to help them coordinate their care. So we're, we're working on a system that helps the information that people need get to them in a timely manner. Okay. It's directly a collaborative system. It goes through the human-computer interaction iterative design cycle of seeing what people need and testing what you've done to see if it meets their needs. Um, and so, for example, right now, it asks parents to put information in, not doctors. Turns out parents have a wealth of information that doctors don't have access to because they see their kid every day. So I had this aha moment. Um, my mother had dementia for many years. I would take her to the doctor and they would say how, she's, how has she been and I could tell them how she had been for the last three days. But they hadn't seen her in six months. This system lets doctors see the last six months. Okay, so one example. Second example is from my colleague Milan Kambe at USC who now has a center for AI and social good. Um, I don't have the video here, but this um, uh, reminds me. His system is being, which is based on something called security games, is being used to, to track, to set the routes for the um, Coast Guard in New York Harbor. <coughs> it sets routes that no person would think of and it's been more effective than the routes they would think of and they love it done, again, in collaboration with people. And they've also used the same idea, the same technology um, for wildlife protection. So an example of the power of computer science and technology is that the same ideas can be used in many, many different settings. Um, the warning is that you have to be careful about how they are used and um, and what they might do that you don't want them to do. Okay, so let me shift then to the last part of my talk, um, where I'm gonna, where I've already said this, but I want to say it again. Ethics said, says we should do good, not just that we should avoid harm. One of the things that excites me about Harvard undergraduates, graduate students do, <laughs> but, is that they really do want to do good in the world. And so we need to help them make good. Um, I will say to all of you who are worried about, you know, super intelligence taking over and I don't know what else, I wish you would put that aside 
not happening in my lifetime. I can't say, some of you are very young, so I'm not saying. Those scenarios are distracting us from the problems we have now. And maybe if we address those problems, we'll be better able to address the future scenarios. So there are different ways to address the ethical concerns that I've raised. One is design, and that's what I'm gonna focus on. You can also incorporate ethical reasoning into a computer system, and there are people trying to do this. That's very hard. We can barely get computer systems to, to reason about causality. So if somebody tells you they have a system that can do moral reasoning and make a decision just remember those images, okay? Push hard to find out what it really can do, what its limits are, and use what you know about ethics to see if it's really doing the kind of ethical reasoning you think that. There are other things you can do, and those who were at Cynthia's talk heard me ask her, well, what's your, what is our responsibility as computer scientists when we put some algorithm or some system out in the world? And making sure the disclaimers are right not hyping over what the capabilities of the system is. It's a big downside of most technology that gets announced. And then there's regulation and policy. Okay, so um, now to the title of the talk. Um, I'm gonna take you, um, so from intelligence, so this is all the background I wanted to give you. I, um, as I mentioned, I uh, have taught this course, Intelligent Systems Design and Ethical Challenges. And this was another wake-up call for me. Um, uh, recommender systems. So we go through four different technologies in the class, one of which is recommender systems. Um, the class meets Tuesday and Thursday. On Tuesday of some week in October each year, we um, talk about the Facebook emotion contagion experiment. Is there anybody who doesn't know what that is? OK. so. <laughs> um, uh, about, I guess now, four years ago, um, Facebook decided that it would do a consumer experiment and it would increase, for some users, it would increase the amount of positive news that they got and, or decrease the amount of negative news. And it wanted to see how emotion would spread through the network. Because they're a corporation, they did not have to do an IRB because they were just doing a customer experiment to see what worked better or something. I don't know what their excuse was. Um, but then they had trouble analyzing the data, so they found somebody at Cornell. <laughs> Salah will know more about this. Now hmm? Now <laughs> I went to Cornell, so I care about this reputation. Um, uh, and since Cornell was using secondary, was a secondary user of the data, they didn't do an IRB. And then a paper came out announcing the result, and then Oh, whatever broke loose, like how dare you, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the class talks about it, led by Mary Gray from Microsoft, who is phenomenal. If you can get her to read a class, do it. Um, okay, that was Tuesday. On Thursday, I taught them about recommender systems, and we do, in all of the ethics, when we introduce ethics in computer science, it's crucial to get the students to actually use what you've been talking about. So the exercise was that they're on a team at a social media company, and um, uh, they're designing something for a new customer. And there's stuff about how to design the system, and then it asks the students to list um, the features that they would want to collect about the, of the, the, first, the users um, in order to run this. And so they meet in their little groups and they discuss this, so there's six or eight little groups of students working together, and then I go to the whiteboard and write down what they say. And it's good I'm looking at the board, not them, because I turn around after they've all reported and I say, so just curious, how many of you discussed ethics when you were making this list? Okay, so the first time I taught, none of them had, zero. Second time, one student had, but it didn't seem like the right thing. She didn't think the group would be interested. Only when I co-taught with Jeff Behrens in the philosophy department did three of the eight groups actually filter their lists by ethics. Now, these are students, 140 some students apply for 20 to 24 slots. They care about ethics. They have to write little essays that ex show how they care about ethics, right? They want to be there. They've just, 48 hours ago, they've talked about ethics. 
It's like implicit bias. If you don't have something in front of your face that tells you to think about it, we don't think about it. Not only do I conjecture that, the assignment has in it, why did or didn't you think about ethics? And that ones who didn't all say, because I know I'm supposed to design something that will make money and work efficiently and whatever list of things I have. And nobody told me to think about it. Okay. So, I used to say collaboration had to be patched in from the start. Now I say ethics has to be taken into from the start. And um, uh, we have to educate computer scientists. And then, and I said this at a Microsoft faculty summit, by the way, companies have to include ethics in their design cycle. So that's what I say to them. What I want to tell you about, um, and uh, the time that's left is a program that um, that I've started. So, so subsequent to the teaching of this, uh, we have a dinner at the end of each of these classes, and the students um, battered me to have more courses like this. Um, I talked to my computer science colleagues about incorporating ethics into their classes just a little bit, and they basically said, "Well, you know something about ethics. I don't know enough to teach it." Um, so, uh, and then one of them told me to talk to Allison Simmons, in the, a, a faculty member in the philosophy department. She will tell you she is not an ethicist. She's a, she does Asian philosophy, is that right, Kate? Early modern. Early, early modern. modern. Early, oh right, Descartes, right. Early modern philosophy. Um, but she cared about making philosophy relevant to now. And so we have developed a program uh, where graduate students and postdocs in philosophy, and Kate, is there anybody else here, Kate, raise your hand. Kate is one of the graduate student teaching fellows. The um, teaching fellows meet with faculty members in computer science and design ethics modules for the computer science course. We are teaching computer science across the curriculum. The goal here is to get our students to see that ethics matters to every aspect of computer systems. It's not just for people in AI. Um, so, um, and to also to give them exposure over the whole course of their education to ethics. Um, so that they learn ethics while they're learning coding. So that they don't say, I know I have to make it efficient and I know I have to make money, but nobody told me ethics, because the ethics becomes part of the mantra as well. Um, so the, how do we, oops, that's quite a mark. How do we do it? As I said, we embed philosophers. We, we um, find really fantastic philosophy graduate students and postdocs who are good teachers, as well as um, knowledgeable about ethics. They meet with the faculty members and sometimes the teaching fellows. They learn enough about the course content to identify an ethical challenge in the course. And I want to highlight that. If you ask, I've done it. If you ask a philosopher if they can help teach a computer science course, they go, ooh. <laughs> but you can do it, right, Kate? It's not, it's not so bad. So this is one of the hurdles we are crossing. We're gonna we're going to send missionaries out in the world to tell the rest of the philosophy students it actually can be fun. All of these class, the class sessions they dissolve, design have active modules. You really have to use it to understand it. And they have an assignment to do afterwards because if you don't give students at Harvard or anywhere else like an assignment, then they think it's not serious. Um, we want the faculty to be in the room um, with at the time this is done to signal the importance of this, and also because technical questions come up. It's not meant to be a separate, a separate piece of the course. It's meant to be integrated, and so having the CS and the ethics in the same room is really important. Um, there's a paper on Dash. If you just type my last name and embedded ethics and Harvard Dash, you will find this paper. It's going to appear in the communications of the ACM. Um, so that's where this chart is from, so you don't have to um, really read it in detail. This is, we've now, um, uh, by the end of this semester, we will have done 18 of the courses at Harvard. And you can see it includes introductory courses. There's some listed here. Courses in theory um, and in programming languages and in systems, not just in HCI and AI. 
Um, this year we added the um, full strength um, systems programming course, CS61, and we added a very basic uh, theory course, applied algebra, um, to the core. We also do courses that uh, Kate, for example, uh, teaches in the, uh, CS, in the e economics and computing. What else do you teach in, have you taught, Kate? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't remember, it's okay. We most of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So every one of these courses, what, one of the side effects, this is a happy unintended consequence, is that my colleagues have all gotten very excited about this and they want to learn ethics. <laughs> because they see, you know, just like the philosophers, ooh, the computer scientists, ooh, but then they see, you know, it's not so bad. Um, so we're now working on sustainability here, and I won't, um, I just think I won't, um, I won't dwell on that. Um, some of the interesting challenges that we're still um, trying to, to work on are how do we measure the long-term effectiveness? Because it's easy to measure, well, it's easy to measure effectiveness of something in a single course over a single semester. Whether whatever you find retained at the end of the semester is retained at the end of an undergraduate education is more difficult to tell. But this is what we call distributed pedagogy. We're distributing the teaching of ethics over someone's whole undergraduate career. And so we need to understand how we could measure whether it's effective or not. So that's one of the challenges. Um, and um, the other challenges have to do with um, uh, building up a corpus of modules. We want to spread this to the world. I will say uh, various colleagues at other institutions have expressed interest in it. Did you hear about Martha Pollock's talk? There was a, so there was a fish drift for me here, and Martha, who was my student, Martha was my student, she's now president of Cornell. She opened the talk, and, she, and Greg Morissette, who's the dean of computing and information science, Martha said she was glad he was here because she wants him to find out about this. So even your institution is knocking on the door. Um, it's also building up this, we want to build up a core of philosophers, not only to teach here, but to teach around the world because, of course, you send your students off to do things like Martha, right? Okay, so let me try to end so there's time for questions. Um, what I said before is to be truly smart, a system has to be designed to work well with people. You need collaboration. And I also want to say that ethics is everyone's responsibility. Let me go back to that slide. So, um, I want to urge people who aren't computer scientists to learn enough computer scientists that you can ask the right questions. Don't believe the advertisements you hear. Think about what you really want to know about the product you're going to buy. More important than understanding your refrigerator, your microwave, et cetera, they all have chips in them. Very important to understand your car. So learn enough. And those who are technologists to learn enough about how to think about ethics to grapple with the fact that different values can lead to different conclusions and you need to understand how to weigh those. So thank you. <laughs>